Hi everybody, welcome back to another episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm really excited, really, really excited about getting into the content of this video because I'm really gonna be getting into the nitty gritty of what exactly I meant in the previous episode when I said that straightness and gayness are not just about sexual attraction, but that there are a range of other features that are part of those categories. And before we get into the content, I wanna make a few caveats. Firstly, if you haven't had the opportunity to watch the previous two videos, What Queerness Means to Me and Rafiki's Advice, I would really encourage you to go back and watch those two videos because the content for this video builds upon and culminates the material from those other two videos. Also importantly, in this video, I'm going to be specifically talking about gayness, not other forms of queerness. Another point is that in this video, I'm going to be speaking about relationality and sexuality. So relationality will refer to the full relational complex that we experience, and that will include both sexual and non-sexual aspects. So sexuality will be kind of a subset of relationality. And the reason I'm doing that is because it can get a little convoluted when I'm talking about homosexuality and heterosexuality as not being just about sexuality. That might be really confusing. I don't even know if that made sense right there. Hopefully it did. So we're not going to use sexuality to refer to the full relational complex that we have as humans. I'm gonna use the term relationality. And that actually might be preferable because let's not pretend that asexual people don't exist. And lastly, the last caveat is, or is it really a caveat? Important piece of information you need to know is that I'm going to be referring substantially to David Halperin's How to Be Gay. Now look, don't judge a book by its cover. It's an excellent book. If you really want to understand where I'm coming from, where this perspective is being grounded, I really would highly suggest that you read this book. Don't judge a book by its cover. Also, you know what? God made bodies. And so this guy's naked in various poses. It's okay. God made it. It's beautiful. Anyways, that's all for now. Let's get into the video. In the last episode, I explained that gayness and straightness do not only refer to sexual things, but they also contain non-sexual aspects. In other words, they go beyond just sexual attraction or sexual behavior. And that's to say that there are parts of our relationality, remember relationality refers to the full relational complex that we have as humans. There are non-sexual aspects of our relationality that lie adjacent to our sexual desires, attractions, etc. And because these non-sexual aspects of our relationality lie adjacent to the sexual aspects of our relationality, the two are inextricably combined together. And I'll explain that. However, the only way we're going to be able to recognize that these categories can have non-sexual aspects is if we're willing to consider the fact that we have had a certain kind of intentionality of consciousness that has caused us to be able to only recognize sexual content in those categories. You might remember in the previous episode I spoke about intentional states of consciousness and by that I mean the certain focuses that our minds or our consciousnesses have toward various objects in the world that cause us to see certain essences or aspects in those things and not others. So if we're going to be able to recognize that there are non-sexual aspects to homosexuality and heterosexuality, we have to become aware of the intentional states of our consciousness that cause us to see those things solely. So just to reiterate, depending on the conscious states that we have are the things that we're going to be able to perceive in the world. And the same thing goes for straightness and gayness. If you go into a study or consideration of gayness and straightness with a focus or intentionality of consciousness that causes you to only be able to see the sexual aspects, you won't be able to recognize that there are non-sexual aspects. In order to be able to recognize the non-sexual aspects of homosexuality and heterosexuality, you're going to have to firstly recognize those intentional states of consciousness and reflect on them and consider how they are affecting your view of those categories. It is once you become reflective on those intentional states of mind that you have that you become able to bracket those ways of thinking off so that you can look at these categories of sexuality more objectively or more for what they are or more broadly. Okay, I think I've beat that horse enough. So now that we've analyzed what things might stand in the way of us being able to consider 
how homosexuality and heterosexuality can refer to more than just the sexual. Now that we have recognized that we often have those intentional states of consciousness, and now that we have bracketed off or suspended those ways of thinking, we're set to be able to think about these categories in a new way. Halperin explains the breadth of what it means to be gay in this way. Being gay would seem to involve an entire attitude and set of values, an entire cultural orientation. It implies a refined sensibility, a heightened aesthetic sense, a particular sensitivity to style and fashion, a non-standard relation to mainstream cultural objects, a rejection of common tastes as well as a critical perspective on the straight world and a collectively shared but nonetheless singular vision of what really matters in life. Many gay men and a number of their straight friends and enemies have long suspected that what makes gay men different from the rest of the world is something that goes well beyond sexual preference or practice. Homosexuality is not just a sexual orientation but a cultural orientation a dedicated commitment to certain social or aesthetic values, an entire way of being. That distinctively gay way of being, moreover, appears to be rooted in a particular queer way of feeling. And that queer way of feeling, that queer subjectivity, expresses itself through a peculiar, dissident way of relating to cultural objects and cultural forms in general. So there are a number of different aspects of this quote that we can talk about, and I'm going to have to do future videos to cover the breadth that it opens up. But what I want to focus on from it right now is how Halperin explains that gayness, and also straightness by implication, is not just a sexual experience, but a full subjective experience of the world that goes beyond the sexual, even as it contains the sexual. In other words, yes, gayness is about sexual attraction, sexual behavior. It is not purely or solely about those things. So in a certain sense, you might say full subjective experience refers to how our gayness affects our entire relational experience. So it works a little like this. So consider from the last video where I used the water bottle as an illustration to explain how often we see certain things in objects and fail to see other things because of the intentional states of consciousness. So imagine that homosexuality is like your experience of this water bottle. So if I were to ask you to describe your experience of the water bottle, you might go and start describing the stickers that are on the bottle or the cap or the water that's inside of it or the fact that it has some weight to it or that you can turn it around and see various aspects or profiles of it. But from a phenomenological perspective of the water bottle, like we discussed in the previous video, just as much a part of the water bottle is the background or the setting in which you are experiencing the water bottle. In other words, you're not just experiencing the bottle by itself floating in an endless nothingness. It has a context, a background. There's the wall, the lights, even me, I'm holding it in my hand. All of these things within view of the bottle are part of the experience of the bottle. So in a certain sense, even though, yes, we might be tempted to think that the most essential parts of the water bottle are the stickers or the cap or the water in it, everything around it plays a role in giving the water bottle its being in a certain sense. And the same thing goes with gayness and straightness. Imagine that same sex or opposite sex sexual desire is the water bottle itself, most censored. So in this illustration, the water bottle itself would represent same sex sexual desire or opposite sex sexual desire or behavior. So when we speak about homosexuality, yes, at the center of everything, more or less, you might say, we have the concerns for same sex sexual desire and the same thing for heterosexuality. It would be opposite sex sexual desire. However, as with the experience of the water bottle in which the background is important, so are the surroundings of same-sex and opposite-sex sexual attraction. So it's not sufficient to say that when we are talking about sexual attraction, whether gay or straight, that we are only talking about sexual attraction. We are necessarily talking about the surroundings of our full relational complex. So this would mean that even the non-sexual aspects of our relationality are part of the backdrop 
of our experience of same-sex and opposite-sex sexual attraction, most specifically. And this way of looking at homosexuality and heterosexuality demonstrates that we can't speak of those categories as being concerned with solely the sexual. Now, you might be wondering, okay, Paul, I hear what you're saying and I'm trying to track, but it doesn't really make sense to me that you're saying homosexuality and heterosexuality can go beyond concerns with merely the sexual. I mean, it does kind of seem intuitive. You're talking about homosexuality, heterosexuality. It makes sense those things are mainly about sexuality or sex or sexual behavior or sexual desire. That makes sense. It seems intuitive. So how does it make sense to say that those categories are not merely about the sexual? Glad you asked. I think the answer largely comes by us realizing that our relationality, our relational selves, is not this fragmented or disjointed reality like we so often speak of it or conceive of it as being. In other words, we think that because we can linguistically isolate the various aspects of our relationality, that these features of our relationality are actually ontologically, or with respect to their very being, separate from one another. In other words, we think that because I can talk about my sexual attractions, by themselves, that they are actually separate from my non-sexual attractions. So we kind of think, here are my non-sexual attractions over here, there are my non-sexual attractions over there. But that's just not how it works. The reality of the matter is that all the various aspects of our relational selves, whether sexual or non-sexual, are inextricably linked and locked with one another. All the various aspects of our relationality and our sexuality inform one another. They influence one another. This means that even if you are trying to speak about one particular matter of your sexuality or your relationality, you are necessarily to varying degrees speaking about other parts of your relational self. And that's why it's critical that we think of homosexuality and also heterosexuality as a full subjective experience rather than pigeonholing it into being just one thing, namely about the sexual. So when I speak of myself as being a gay subject, I'm saying that every aspect of my gayness informs the full subjective experience I have of the world. So sexuality and relationality kind of work like a spider web. So if you've ever poked at the center of a spider web, you notice that it's not just the center part of the spider web that moves. All the various strands of the web are going to receive tension in proportion to its proximity to the center. And the same thing works with same sex and opposite sex sexual attraction. So even if you're trying to most specifically hone in on sexual attraction and sexual behavior, because sexuality is like a spider web, all the various strands and aspects of our sexuality coming toward the center that we're trying to focus on, if you press on that center, it is simply going to be a fact of the matter that you're going to move the other aspects of your sexuality. And that's gayness, that's straightness. That's how those categories work. The aspects of our sexuality are just not isolatable, except maybe linguistically or theoretically. Now, I recognize that this video has probably been pretty technical, but I've been trying to explain how we can think of homosexuality and heterosexuality as being more than just categories about the sexual, even though that might seem counterintuitive. But the only way that we're gonna be able to recognize that those categories go beyond just the sexual is if we become aware of and reflect upon and bracket the intentional states of consciousness that lead us to see certain things in these categories over others. Once we do this, it opens us up to a world of consideration where we're able to think of gayness and straightness as not only about the sexual, but about how we think about gender and gender roles, aesthetics and how we show platonic affection to our friends and family. In other words, this way of thinking about sexuality encourages a more holistic way of thinking about it. In this episode, I've given a theory of how we can think about those categories as being more than just sexual categories. But in the next episode, or maybe two, maybe three, I don't know, we're gonna see how thinking of those categories as going beyond just the sexual cashes out in the everyday life. Like what does it mean for a gay person to have a different subjective experience of the world than a straight person? Like Halpern was explaining in the quote I read earlier. Now you might be wondering, okay, I see what you're saying. You might even be right, hopefully I am. But what does it actually mean in our everyday experience of the world? What are the implications that this way of thinking about sexuality as non-sexual actually has for my everyday life? How will it affect the way that I interact with queer people? How will it affect how I think about myself as a straight person? All excellent questions. I love your questions. I think it'll take 
future videos to really go into it, but suffice it to say that often Christians, whether progressive or conservative in their sexual ethics, often put forward views about what queer people's lives are like because they don't do a deeper study about what our lives are like. Whether you're a progressively minded Christian or conservatively minded one, most Christians have a very hypersexualized view about what it means to be gay because of the way that media and various literature have portrayed gay people's lives. Our sexuality has been co-opted as this thing that is only concerned with sex and ravenously so. And this has led to often progressives saying things like, if a gay person is not sexually active, they're not living up to their full relational potential. And conservatives say that homosexuality is sin. Both perspectives are completely unnuanced and it is evident that neither perspective has been informed by any thoroughgoing study of science or psychology or philosophy on sexuality. And because Christians have not done the deep work of thinking about this matter, it causes harm to LGBT plus people. Yet Romans 13, 9 and 10 give this wisdom. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. So it becomes a very simple question. Is the way that you have thought about gay people's subjective experience doing us no harm? I mean, are you really being considerate about what you're willing to say and believe about our experience? Are you being thoughtful about what our experience as gay people might entail so that you aren't espousing views that are directly detrimental to our well-being? If love truly does no harm, and if we as queer people are your neighbor, you have the responsibility to make sure that what you believe about us does no harm to us. Now this doesn't mean that we're all gonna come to the same conclusions on matters, but this is more of a call to make sure that you have done the necessary work of thinking very deeply about a very complex state of existence that we as queer people have. It still might be that there are certain aspects of those beliefs that need to be chipped away at. It's once we're willing to reflect on the ways that we think about other people's lives that we come to better appreciate each other and respect and love one another. And it's when we're willing to be thoughtful about how we think about other people and other people's experiences that we can truly begin to say that we do no harm to our neighbor. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was informative and helpful. Until next time, peace and God bless. Hey YouTubers, I hope you really enjoyed this video and I hope it was beneficial for you. If it was, I invite you to like, share, and comment below, please respectfully. And also I invite you to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you are alerted when I release any more content. Thank you so much.